Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Martin Kölling. Uh, I'm East Asia correspondent with Handelsblatt and co-chair of the Professional Activities Committee. Uh, and it is my great honor to welcome our today's guest speaker, uh, Foreign Minister Hayashi. And uh, without any further ado, I would like to open the floor because we don't have much time. <laughs> and he doesn't need a long introduction. And um, he will have a 15-minute speech, and then we will open the floor for questions and answers. Just one reminder out of courtesy to our guests, please switch your mobile phones off or to silent mode. Thank you very much, and now I hand the microphone to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Martin, for your very quick uh, introduction, <laughs> so, if any. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me again here. Uh, and I still remember last time I spoke here was uh, September 2 or 21, before I became this position. And at that time, uh, COVID-19 was in full swing, so that uh, diplomacy is still uh, heavy, heavily restrained by the COVID-19. And at the same time, I assumed that FCCJ and your job are also the, under the heavy uh, kind of restraint uh, under the COVID-19. And in these two years, uh, the global situations have uh, uh, changed dramatically. I should say, and uh, especially in February uh, last year, Russia uh, started its aggression against uh, Ukraine. So the international community, including ourselves, strongly condemned Russia and imposed sanctions against uh, Russia. And however, regrettably, uh, Russia's uh, outrageous acts still continue as of today. So uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine is not a problem uh, for Europe alone. And the security of Europe and that of uh, East Asia and in the Pacific are inseparable. So Ukraine today may be East Asia tomorrow. And we have repeatedly conveyed this message to the international community. And with the world facing various uh, global challenges, uh, last year alone I attended the G7 foreign ministers meeting for 11 times. As you recall, normally uh, under the, the British uh, leadership in the year before last, we have twice. And even before that, we have only once in a year for a G7 foreign minister meeting. But the last year, under the German leadership, thanks to you maybe, uh, we had 11 times. So, uh, and this year, we took uh, the pattern of the G7 presidency from Germany. And in February, I hosted the uh, first G7 foreign ministerial uh, ministers meeting under our presidency uh, when we got together for the Munich Security uh, Conference. And then I convened, uh, convened the G7 foreign ministers meeting in Kaluizawa, Nagano, in April. And we had good discussions in preparation for the Hiroshima summit. And as an outcome of the meeting, we issued the G7 foreign ministers communique. And in the communique, the G7 uh, confirmed for the first time in writing its commitment to the free and open international order based on the rule of law. And its strong opposition to any unilateral attempt to change the status quo uh, by force uh, in anywhere in the world. So furthermore, we discussed nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation in detail. So we also uh, talked about our cooperation uh, with the countries of the so-called global south and global issues such as energy and food security. And then, as you may recall, uh, we successfully convened the G7 summit in Hiroshima last month. And the G7 leaders held the candid and the in-depth discussions among, the, among themselves and with the invited countries and organizations. So today I would like to present some of the outcomes of the G7 Hiroshima summit and also Japan's future diplomacy. The summit was held at a time when the international community is at a historical turning point and the G7 leaders, they are found 
at their unwavering unity at the G7 Hiroshima summit. And the participants, including the invited countries, uh, agreed on some of the key points, and I will highlight uh, them. So firstly, all countries should adhere to the principles of the United Nations Charter. And secondly, confrontation uh, should be resolved peacefully through dialogue. And we support a just and durable uh, peace based on respect for international uh, law and the principles of UN Charter. And thirdly, any unilateral uh, attempt to change the status quo by force is unacceptable anywhere in the world. And forcefully, we strive to uphold the free and open international order based on the rule of law. With these points agreed, including, inclu <coughs> including all those outreached countries, I believe we have achieved the objectives that we initially set out for the summit. And in addition, we also deepened our discussions on the global economy, including food and energy securities. And discussions also covered a broad range of global challenges, including climate change, development, global health, and artificial intelligence. The G7 leaders confirmed the direction of our response to these challenges. And on top of these, our aim of holding the summit in Hiroshima, as you know, was also, uh, also to allow the leaders to experience the reality of the nuclear weapons use and commit, communicate them to the world. So in that regard, I feel that the visit to Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum was a historic and valuable uh, opportunity for all the leaders. I believe that they deepened their understanding of the reality of the nuclear weapons use in a silent and a solemn atmosphere. The messages the leaders wrote in the guest book uh, actually clearly show it. At the summit, we issued the G7 leaders Hiroshima vision on nuclear disarmament. The first G7 leaders standalone document uh, focusing on nuclear disarmament. And we will continue and strengthen our realistic and practical efforts to realize this vision. President Zelensky joined the discussions on Russia's aggression against Ukraine. The G7 leaders demonstrated their unwavering solidarity with Ukraine. We also confirmed that the G7 uh, would uh, continue its severe sanctions against Russia and strong support for Ukraine and make every effort to bring peace to Ukraine. At Hiroshima, there was a session exclusively dedicated to economic uh, resilience and economic security for the first time in the history of G7 summit. So the importance of a multilateral trading system remains unchanged. But having said that, we must also uh, strengthen the economic resilience and economic security of the, of the entire international community together uh, with the Global South partners. To this end, the G7 will step up collaborative efforts among its members, such as strengthening the resilience of supply chains and critical infrastructure, launching the coordination platform on economic cohesion and other initiatives. Since Japan is the only uh, G7 member from Asia, we took the lead in discussion on the Indo-Pacific Prime Minister Kishida explained his new plan for a free and open in the Pacific FOIP. The G7 concurred that we would continue to work together to realize the FOIP. And the idea of the FOIP is fundamentally underpinned by the principles of defending freedom and the rule of law. The rule of law is most needed actually by vulnerable, weaker, smaller countries. So if the international community is to enjoy freedom, we need respect for sov sovereignty and territorial integrity, peaceful resolution of disputes, no use of force. 
and other principles of the UN Charter as important preconditions. So the equally, equally important principles of the FOIB are respect for diversity, inclus inclusiveness, and openness. So this means not excluding anyone, not creating different camps, and not imposing values on others. The current historic turning point is characterized by the lack of universally accepted notion on the nature of the international order. The paradigm of international relations is shifting, and we are searching for an approach that will set the tone for the next era. The fundamental concept of the FOIP I just described is becoming increasingly relevant. So now we need to share the FOIP vision of maintaining and strengthening a free and open inter international order based on the rule of law among a broad range of partners in the international community. So we must lead the world towards cooperation, not division or confrontation. So the G7 Hiroshima summit is over now. However, we hold the G7 presidency until the end of this year. So there are many chances to work with international partners, including Global South, such as the G20 summit in New Delhi, and the SDG summit in September, and the ASEAN-Japan commemorative summit in December, to name a few. So the G20 is a group of highly influential countries Am I quoted by somebody? <laughs> okay, so G20 is a group of highly influential countries in the international community, and cooperation with and within the G20 is especially important today. So Japan will work hard to ensure that the outcomes of the G7 Hiroshima Summit will provide constructive inputs to the G20 New Delhi Summit in India. We will launch and deliver um, concrete uh, cooperation initiatives to tackle challenges such as food, development, and health. So we will also continue to promote cooperation with a broad range of international partners beyond the G7. And I have to mention our relationship with ASEAN, of course. We invited Indonesia, the ASEAN chair, and Vietnam as ASEAN member state to the G7 Hiroshima summit. This year marks actually the 50th year of ASEAN-Japan friendship and cooperation. It is a relationship that has developed remarkably since 1973. So Japan fully supports the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, AYP, which shares the fundamental principles with the FOIP. Japan will continue to promote concrete cooperation projects in line with the four priority areas of AOIP, namely maritime cooperation, connectivity, and the SDGs, and economic and other possible areas of cooperation. To this end, we announced a new contribution of 100 million US dollars to the Japan ASEAN Integration Fund in last month, March. So we will take the opportunity of this 50th and basically to invigorate these efforts. We will engage in close dialogue with the ASEAN and listen to their needs carefully. At the ASEAN-Japan Commemorative Summit in coming December, we will set forth a new vision for cooperation with a wide range of concrete cooperation items. So turning to the United Nations, Japan holds a seat on the UN Security Council in 2023, coinciding our G7 presidency. So this puts us in a position where we have the responsibility of taking a greater leadership role in the international community. This January, during Japan's Security Council presidency, I hosted the Security Council Ministerial open debate on the rule of law in New York. I chose this topic because I believe that the rule of law is really essential for today's world, which faces a variety of challenges. 
The rule of law is also relevant to UN Security Council reform. The promotion of the rule of law is the foundation of multilateralism. The UN is the core of multilateralism, and the Security Council is its guardian. So the reform of the Council is an urgent task. And in addition, we need to strengthen the UN as a whole, including the laws of the, laws of the General Assembly and the Secretary General. So we will continue our efforts to strengthen the UN's functions, including the Security Council reform. So Japan's G7 presidency continues throughout this year. I will continue to engage in dialogue with my counterparts, the G7 foreign ministers. We will uphold and strengthen the free and open international order based on the rule of law and enhance relations with our international partners. From these perspectives, I will continue to lead the discussion in the G7 and make extensive diplomatic efforts to fulfill Japan's responsibilities as the G7 presidencies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Oh, hands up. Okay, I will open the floor. Thank you, Richard Lloyd Parry of The Times. Uh, you said, and the Prime Minister has also said, that the situation of Ukraine today could be that of East Asia tomorrow. And I wondered if you could unpack what that means. D does that mean that the, the threat posed by China in East Asia is equivalent to the threat posed by Russia in Europe? In other words, should we regard Xi Jinping as the Vladimir Putin of East Asia? That was my first question. My second was about your, Please. very quick one, about your political situation. It was reported in the SA Shimbun very recently that uh, Akia Abe, the widow of Prime Minister Abe, visited Yamaguchi recently and has given her support to Mr. Shinji Yoshida, who is the, your rival uh, to be the LDP's candidate in the number three constituency in Yamaguchi. Are you disappointed that the Abe family is not supporting you? And does it threaten your ambition to be the ninth prime minister from Yamaguchi? Thank you. Uh, for the first question, the, when we say the, uh, uh, the Ukraine today is, could be at, uh, uh, tomorrow in East Asia, we don't name any specific name of the countries. But uh, uh, as we see, say this, if this uh, aggression by Russia uh, in any way deemed successful uh, by anybody or in the history book, then that will send a very long message to the world. So that's what we mean. And second question, the Yamaguchi LDP uh, organization is in the process of uh, deciding who will be uh, the uh, new uh, chief of each, each individual uh, electoral uh, organization so that I will uh, really carefully watching their move now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Hokkaido, uh, Nishimura with Hokkaido Shimbun. Um, the the, after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, uh, there has been no specific progress in, in terms of bilateral diplomatic relationship between Japan and Russia. So which, that is the great disappointment for the former uh, residents of the Northern Territory of Japan. And uh, when do you think that those uh, former residents can visit their home islands in Northern Territory next. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. And uh, basic stance of a diplomacy uh, that uh, uh, settling the territorial issues of Northern Territories and uh, go for the peace treaty with Russia is remain unchanged. But under these circumstances that Russia uh, 
started uh, aggression vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, it's very difficult to say uh, in a concrete manner that when this will be changing into the situation that we could further uh, pursue the basic stance of a policy before the Russia's aggression. So, but uh, I met with all those people uh, waiting for uh, the visit and also visit, pay a visit to their uh, tombs. So uh, that's going to be the most important issues that we have to tackle on. And that's even, even before uh, this situation uh, changed back to the situation before the aggression. We have to tackle with these issues with a continuous effort. Thank you. Okay, I have one online question, which I will take now too, because it's already, was he already way before. It's by Regis Arnaud Le Figaro from France. Uh, your ministry refuses to issue a passport to, a, to war correspondent Junpei Yasuda, depriving him from his job in uh, Japan from rare analysis. Your ministry did the same to colleagues Yuichi Sugimoto and Kosuke uh, Tsur Tsuneoka. As for Junpei Yasuda, your ministry claims that to deny his passport is necessary to, quote, keep international trust of Japan. It seems that uh, such action rather undermines international trust in Japan, and uh, as uh, no other developed countries refused to issue passports to war journalists, including uh, taken, those taken hostage. Isn't your ministry practicing pasuhala, passport harassment? No. Oh. Would you accept as minister in charge of Japan's start status abroad as a democracy to look again into Mr. Yasuda's case? Hmm. So uh, uh, since I didn't have any kind of concrete information and the materials here in my uh, mm. uh, paper, so I would like to refrain from the specific case of okay. uh, all those things. Thank okay. you. Okay. Then I saw Kaldun and then uh, many other questions were asked too. I have basically everybody on the list. Kaldun. Khaldun Azari, pan Orient News and Arab News Japan. First, thank you very much, Mr. for <coughs> allowing English questions at the Foreign Ministry. <laughs> That's very good. We hope also English answers in the future. My question is about the sanctions. I, I think you said we have to continue sanction sanctions against Russia. Mm. And then you said we have to lead the world toward cooperation, not a division. So it seems like these uh, two statements are a little bit conflicting. Uh, it, it, what exactly do you, do you expect from the sanction against Russia to collapse? Russia is a nuclear power, and um, some people say if this country reached the edge of collapsing, they might use nuclear weapons. Uh, in this way, sanctions is a danger for the world uh, uh, destiny, basically. And also, uh, don't you think, the, where's the sound of diplomacy? Uh, do you think dialogue uh, would be a good idea instead of like sanctions and uh, extending the war? Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you very much for uh, coming here from the Kasumi Club, so that I can speak in English here. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you're right that uh, we are saying that more, more cooperation and more dialogue is more important than the division. And in case of Russia's aggression in Ukraine, that uh, applies to uh, that. The basic uh, way of thinking is not changed. But to all those dialogue works, we need some environment. And uh, judging from the situation, especially what the Russia is saying and doing, uh, I think uh, it's important that the G7 and like-minded countries uh, still remain unity and continue severe sanctions against the Russia to end its aggression as soon as possible so that uh, uh, we c uh, could lead to the phase that we could use the dialogue and peace talks. Thank you. Uh, Isabel Reynolds from Bloomberg, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask about relations with South Korea. Um, 
obviously under under the new government in South Korea, relations have improved drastically. Mm. Um, but many people warn that this could end as soon as there's a change of administration in South Korea. Do you feel Japan has compromised enough to bring the South Korean public on board with uh, a recreation of relations? And if not, what more can Japan do um, to improve the situation? Yeah, thank you very much. I actually, uh, the recent Japan Republic of Korea summit meeting in Hiroshima on May 21 was the third summit meeting in the last uh, two months. So this is a clear sign of the progress in the Japan ROK bilateral relationship. And uh, please understand that I cannot comment on the other countries' domestic issues, but uh, to keep the stronger uh, uh, relationship with the go Korean government now is really important and uh, uh, show that the best bilateral uh, betterment of this bilateral relationship uh, will lead into some uh, good signs either on the culture or social or political or even security so that uh, uh, one by one to show the result of this betterment of the relationship and then that will uh, send the hope free to send the signals to both of the people in Japan and South Korea. Please allow a follow up from my side on this issue. Do you have what is your plan to uh, to improve this situation uh, to improve the relations? Can you look, give us a little bit insight in what you are planning to do more to, uh, to uh, improve the situations further? Mm -hmm. There was many issues between our two countries, and um, one by one that uh, it's been discussed, and some of them already showing some result. And for example, the uh, I expect that our defense minister will see his counterpart from South Korea very soon and discuss about their own issues. And also political dialogue in various uh, levels are already uh, starting. And we see at the uh, METI uh, rebel, METI uh, and the counterpart in South Korea, I also started uh, dialogue. So various rebel, various uh, Rhines are starting to discuss about the betterment of a uh, uh, relationship. So, uh, uh, Doing one by one uh, is the only way. I, I don't have any magic to do all at once, but the one by one is the steps. Okay. Daijin, konnichiwa. Chugoku Shanghai Toho Telebi Shikaku no Suo to moshimasu. Can you ask in, in English, please? Yes, yes. Uh, do you share the concerns that you the uh, current Sino-Japanese relationship appears to be only and heavily dependent on the public who are not government officials and the latter this won't necessarily have a great outcome but could even made, make matters worse. Uh, do you have plans to change this situation at the government level? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, at the Hiroshima summit, the G7 actually confirmed that we stand prepared to build a constructive and stable relations with China. And they also recognize that the importance of engaging candid, candidly with and expressing our concerns directly to uh, China. So, and uh, uh, I will refrain from commenting each and every one of the China's reaction to the outcomes of the summit. But uh, we consistently maintain the policy to firmly maintain and assert our position and strong, strongly request China's responsible actions. And at the same time, we continue dialogue, uh, including on concerns and cooperate uh, on matters of common interest. And I believe that the both sides need to make efforts to build such a constructive and stable relationship. And this is actually what I reiterated to Foreign Minister Chingan and Director Wan Yi and Premier Li uh, Chan during my visit to Beijing in last April. So we will continue to communicate closely with China at all levels, including uh, the levels of leaders and foreign ministers. Thank you.
Kedi. Uh, thank you very much, um, Teddy Jimbo with the video news. And uh, I'm Mr. Hachi, thank you for coming to the FCCJ. It's uh, actually a big deal for FCCJ to have a foreign minister uh, speaking. Anyway, uh, I'd like to ask a question uh, concerning your political future. It's kind of a domestic question to a foreign, uh, for a foreign minister, but you've been regarded as the one with the next prime minister hopeful for some time, I think, and you have actually run in the LDP's presidential election before. But one of the dro uh, main drawback uh, uh, by Nagatacho standard was you were an uh, upper house member, but now you have gained a seat in the lower house, and you even added the uh, foreign ministership to your portfolio. And uh, uh, credential-wise, uh, I think uh, you are more than enough to qualify for the prime minister. So my question is, what do you think uh, it will take for you to become a prime minister uh, now that uh, the credential uh, should be more than enough? So what is it uh, that, that you need to do uh, to uh, climb to the top? And uh, how long do you think it will take for you to realize that? Uh, and what do you think you have to do to realize that? I know you do uh, 100 sit-ups every day. So in addition to that, what do you have to do to, be, to become the prime minister? Thank you. Thank you, Jim Busan. And uh, now uh, the, you know, my uh, training is not uh, uh, becoming everyday things. I a little bit uh, became a little bit tired of uh, all sorts of things happening. But uh, yeah, I, I wish I know what's remaining, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, if I knew, I would certainly do that. Or you know, so uh, and uh, w I I've been in this uh, Nagata show almost 28 years, and I see a lot of people. And some people are very good from my viewpoint and very wise, very nice characters and strong leadership. But sometimes, or more, more than sometimes, those people are not have a chance to become the top of the ladder. And at the same time, there's not so much about that, but, you know, characters. But sometimes, uh, you know, those things can happen. So when you become a minister, sometimes your effort is very important and the excellence in those issues are required for that. But maybe for the top of the ladder, uh, maybe you need, the, on the top of that, that could need something different. So more than excellence in policies. Um, maybe that could be something you know, regarded as a leadership. And uh, the definition of leadership is really difficult. So, and uh, now I'm running a lot, uh, being in this uh, position, and requires so many uh, decisions almost every day. So uh, maybe doing this job daily in an honest way might be one of the things that I have to do for the next step. Thank you. Yugi. Ilgin Yorulmaz for BBC Turkish and I welcome you as well. Um, I want to ask you about the Immigration Control and Refugee Bill which uh, I'm sure an opinion was sought from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It was scrapped two years ago due to uh, protests here and abroad, but was passed virtually untouched last month in the lower house. There is no mentioning of an independent body to assess applications. There's no consideration for the children of illegal foreign nationals there. Um, and meanwhile, of course, Japan continues to accept just 1% of refugee applications submitted annually. My question is, given the fact that Japan will face an 11 million worker shortfall in 2040, which is less than 20 years from now, 
Is your government open to making the Ministry of Justice, the Immigration Agency, a work with your foreign ministry and perhaps the Ministry of Health and Welfare to create a more comprehensive, humane solution to the problem? And can the status of those refugee applicants, and some of them are actually Kurdish ethnic origin, um, be legalized to make them tax-paying workers contributing to the Japanese society instead of seeking political asylum based on questionable motives and ending up being deported and straining your country's relationship with mm. other countries. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as you mentioned in your question, that's basically in the jurisdiction of the Justice Ministry. So in more macro views, uh, if we say we need more labor or we need more population for economic growth, nobody might come. So be open for uh, the people coming from abroad and each community are more acceptable for that. I don't say the community now is not acceptable. I am not accepting all those people, but uh, uh, the public understanding and atmosphere is really important for that. So that's why actually the uh, uh, specified skilled worker was the light translation. That when we started that, before there was a skill training trainee system. So that's why we decided to have a, a specified skilled, skilled worker, because it's worker, not the trainee. So I think that's a great step we made, so that, that they are now uh, actually working, not a training. And uh, so, uh, and also on that the status, we have a kind of second phase of that, and then you can bring your families and all those uh, things. So, uh, one by one, step by step, I think compared to 10 years ago, the Japanese uh, society uh, feel more kind of easy, not uneasy for those people coming from uh, abroad, the living in your society. So that's why uh, public acceptance is really important to make a, 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 a political decision for that. But uh, we are in the right direction. And if you hurry too much, then there might be a backlash for uh, those uh, issues. As we see uh, in the case of European countries, there's some backlash. So that's why... Uh, uh, it used to be a backlash, I would say. So that's why the step by step, one by one approach is very interesting, uh, very important. And at the same time, you know, like I, I said at the beginning, you know, please come because we need more labor. It's not the way, but uh, we need more uh, very skilled and the train and space. Uh, 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 more, more kind of professional or people at the same time. So that's why we kind of opening up for uh, society for uh, those um, those people, and there's a system for that too. But sorry, I, I'm I'm not in the you know Ministry of Justice, so and I don't have some papers for that. But that's the macro view that uh, what what we we should. Uh, uh, do uh, towards the future. I am very sorry. I think we have to end the press conference here. The 40 minutes are almost over. It's, and asking mm -hmm. another question would go over the time. Yep. We can't do that. So, But what I want to do is uh, please hand you an uh, honorary membership. We have oh. a grand piano, <laughs> so you can play here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.